good to see you all here on this Ash Wednesday, 2023. Um, this gives you an opportunity to get eyes on uh, this swelling youth group that we have right now. We've, we're actually missing a couple of kids tonight, and we're taking up two pews. Great kids. We're about to go to Veritas in a couple of weekends. They're excited about that, and um, they're a little nervous about being here in church on Ash Wednesday. Some of them, for them, it's the very first time they've experienced this. So I'm going to explain a little bit about Ash Wednesday. On Ash Wednesday, we admit that we're what we're showing on the outside oftentimes reflects on what we are on the inside, soiled, dirty, and unclean. Uh, Ash Wednesday allows believers in Jesus Christ to make this kind of a public response to our sin. Traditionally, the ashes that we use on Ash Wednesday are gathered up after the palms from the previous year's Palm Sunday. So on Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Easter, we have the palms and we wave them and the kids process in. And then we take those palm leaves and burn them to make the ashes for the coming year. Each year, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent and it's 46 days before Easter. Lent is a 40-day season marked by repentance, fasting, reflection, and ultimately celebration on resurrection morning. This 40-day period represents Christ's time in the wilderness where he fasted and where Satan tempted him. Lent asked believers to set aside a time each year for similar fasting, mark an intentional season of focus on Christ's life, ministry, sacrifice, and resurrection. The ashes show us that Jesus is the only one who can truly cleanse us from our sins. When ashes are administered to believers, it's always by hand. I'll put those ashes on your um, forehead or on your hand, if you prefer, in the sign of a cross. And it's, um, it's not only admitting our uncleanness, but also it, it reminds us that we can experience Christ's healing touch. I want to invite you to open your bulletins and join me in this evening's responsive reading. So, kids, you're going to you're going to read the bold lines, okay? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of repentance, I Surrender All.
on a bulletin, young people. That means the work of the people. We'll say this passage together. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of God's salvation. We tremble in fear and anticipation at the nearness of a great and mighty God. Return with all your heart, with weeping, fasting, and mourning. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus and receive a new and right spirit within. We will fast and pray as an inner discipline and prepare our lives for faithful discipleship. You may be seated. Today's scripture passage comes to us from Paul's letter to the 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, and we'll be reading verse 20 through verses 6, chapter 6 and verse 10. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This passage of Scripture comes to us, um, and it's, it's somewhat disjointed. It, it concludes a thought in chapter 5 and then begins anew um, in chapter 6. Paul is um, in a state of alienation from the church in Corinth. He's had a, he's had a difficult time. Um, in his ministry there, and people, Paul doesn't live into what people think an apostle should be. They think a, an apostle should be this person of great bearing and have the ability to be a great rhetorician, in, in other words, a good preacher, and and that Paul should have, he should conduct himself with authority and discipline those in the church, and because he does not live into the expectations of some of the folks in the church. Um, he is humiliated in public by a church member. And he is in the process of trying to reconcile a right relationship, not only with this person who offended him, but also with the church itself. Paul, we know, was a zealous Jew, a person who persecuted people who followed the way, people who were of the sect of the Nazarene, people who followed Jesus, who believed Jesus was Messiah. He jailed people. He had them beaten. Some even lost their lives. He held the coat of those who stoned Stephen and watched as they put him to death outside the gates of the city. Today on Ash Wednesday, we come to this beginning of Lent to be reminded of our own mortality. Now, some of us kids are a little bit closer to the end of our life. Our, 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 our glass is, has less sand on the top than it does on the bottom, and it behooves all of us to be mindful of that because we are not promised 
another day. Um, yesterday is spent, and today is what we have. And so Paul encourages us, and I encourage you as well, to understand that um, you, you should never put off for tomorrow what can be done today. You should never, you should never push away a move of God's Holy Spirit in your life. You should never go to sleep without thinking about what you did and said over the course of a day and asking God to forgive you for those sins that you've committed and, and making a commitment to try and do better. Um, to repent means to turn and go the other way, to do a 180. So it doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean that we don't fall in the mud, right? Everybody falls in the mud. A sheep falls in the mud, and they get up and shake it off and walk on. A pig falls in the mud, and they stay there and wallow. Don't, don't be a pig. Don't be a pig. During the course of um, the last 10 days that I spent in the Holy Land, I saw some things that were spectaculars, um, that were amazing. Um, right now in Israel is the wet season. So they have a dry season and a wet season. They're in the northern hemisphere just like us. So it's, it's cool there right now. It's between like low 50s to mid 60s. But you know they've got fields full of corn and squash and um, cauliflower and lettuce and just about anything you'd ever want to think of. Orchards full of mangoes and avocados, trees are green, the almond trees were getting ready to bud and bloom um, as we were getting ready to leave. One of the things that I found the most amazing about this place, and you're going to hear a lot about this, I'm sorry, you sent me, you're stuck with me. Um, one of the things that I found really surprising is from the Mount of Olives down into the Kidron Valley and then up to the Temple Mount, is one colossal graveyard from the top to the bottom. I mean, you're on the very top of that mountain, and it's just all of these, all of these um, sarcophagus and these ossuaries and tombstones and carved tombs. And um, it's very important for the Jewish people that can afford to be to be buried there because they believe that the closer that you're buried to the temple, the sooner you're going to be resurrected when Messiah comes. Uh, Messiah is going to come and walk through the mercy gate. And they've got the mercy gate blocked off because they don't want anybody pretending to be Messiah. And, and as you go to the bottom of the valley and start coming up the Temple Mount, the, the tombs and sarcophagus get a little more elaborate. And I found out that a burial place in that part of the cemetery cost between a half and four million dollars. Wow. One half to four million dollars. First off, I have to observe there's some very wealthy Jews. Secondly, I, I can't imagine that being so important, but apparently it's very important to them. And as I was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'll, I'll make sure to show you a picture of this. I did not post this on Facebook. We're, we're in this place, and we have made this appointment, and we're inside of a fence, and there's all these olive trees, and we sit down together, and we're, and we're talking and reflecting on Scripture and our leaders speaking to us. And then at, as that time concluded, he encouraged us to kind of spread out in this space. It was, a, it was a fairly big green space, and all these ancient olive trees. And I was looking for a place that, that would be quiet, and I kind of got off to myself. And I came to this little niche that was that was surrounded by a, a wrought iron fence, and there was a hole there that was just, it was a carnal house. It was full of bones, full of bones. Really sobering. I mean, I'm there where Jesus was, um, where he prayed the night before he was crucified, and then I look down and there's all of these bones in that hole, and it reminded me. That I'm 61 years old, soon going to be 62, and that my years are numbered on this earth. That God wrote that down in His book before I ever drew my first breath, and and during the course of my years, I've seen small children go on to be with the Lord. I've seen kids 
9, 10 years old, teenagers, adults, young adults, older adults. The truth is that we were made from ashes and dust, and to that dust we'll return. And on this Ash Wednesday, that is one of the reminders that we that we have. And, and Paul tells us that today is the day of salvation. Paul reminds us that to be reconciled to God, and, and that if we have anything that's between um, us and another person, something that we need to forgive somebody about, something something that we need to make a clean breast of and confess, um, that today's the day. We shouldn't be putting those things off because we may not have another chance. Today is the day that we have. I want to invite you to pray with me. Lord, tonight we will receive the smudges of ashes. We'll come forward and be marked as disciples, as those who have been called, cleansed, forgiven, and healed. We do not step on this journey of Lent lightly because following Jesus is not easy. There are going to be times of great joy and wonder during the course of this Lent, and there will be times of confusion and fear. But through all of this, God, you're with us, guiding us, comforting us, leading us. And though the night is dark, there's much darkness in this world. And we commit ourselves to place our trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, whom you have blessed and given to us. Help us to follow in his steps and place our trust in him as we enter this Lenten journey. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to enter into a period of silence with me as we, um, as we really look deep into our hearts and as we speak to God on a personal level. too often uncomfortable with silence. We live lives of busyness and noise. And yet you invite us into this moment of silence, this moment of quiet and reflection. Prepare us, Lord, for the journey ahead. Remind us of your love for us as we seek to follow Jesus all the days of our Again, we offer these prayers in Christ's name. Amen. Almighty God, you created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant us that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence. And may we remember that it's only by your gracious gift that we're given everlasting life through Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to come and receive the imposition of the ashes. Um, if you prefer not to have it on your forehead, you can hold your palm out and that, that'll be the sign to me that that's, pardon me, that's where you would like them placed. So I invite you to come.
having been marked with the sign of the cross as a sign of your mortality, I encourage you to lead a holy Lent, to consider what it might mean to give some things up, to take on some new spiritual disciplines, to, um, to be a help to somebody in the community, um, to find new ways to express your faith and to share that faith. If you are interested in a, in a Lenten devotional, there are a number of copies on the Bureau outside. I made those copies today. It's a beautiful um, Lenten book um, that the pastor slaved over and the kids helped me put together and mm -hmm. staple. I encourage you to take one of those home as you prepare for your Lenten journey. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, Have Thou Our Way, Lord God's beloved. Look at those who you meet and remember each one is also God's beloved. Go knowing your days on earth are numbered. Make the most of each day you're given by showing kindness and fighting for justice. Go and embark on this Lenten journey. Go where God sends you to do God's work. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen.